Hunter, Prey, by Andy Hoare. Gasping for breath in the darkness, Neem Fortuna stifled a scream. She felt the beast lunge towards her, scant moments before its tremendous weight barreled into her chest, its claws gripping her wrists and slicing into the flesh as she was slammed into the flagstone paving. The beast's snarling face was right in her own, its animal breath huffing against her skin, saliva specking her cheek. It wore dull grey armour, and a glint of light reflected in huge canine teeth as it opened its mouth to roar. She screamed in denial. The beast bellowed in fury, and for an instant her eyes locked with the two dark pits mere centimetres from her face, tiny malevolent sparks of animal rage, glowing crimson in the darkness before her. She thrashed and wrestled and screamed, but the beast's claws sank into the raw flesh of her wrists, blood seeping through her sleeves and turning the stones beneath slick. The beast reared, and Neem Fortuna knew with a stark clarity that the events of the previous twenty-four hours would lead to her death. Here in the dark, and a cold stone floor on an emperor-forsaken wasteland at the edge of hell. Incense drifted upwards in a lazy spiral from the ornate censer set on the floor, its cloying scent permeating the room and turning the light from the dim glow globe a cold blue. Neem was sat cross-legged and still before the censer, her shaven head lowered as she breathed the ritual incantations that would allow her to enter a state of meditation in which she could send her consciousness beyond the confines of her physical body. She breathed deeply, feeling the hot smoke fill her lungs. After a moment of warm lightheadedness, she began to perceive the room around her, to sense its dimensions and texture despite the fact that her eyes were closed in deep concentration. Reaching beyond the boundaries of her chamber, the psyker allowed her spirit self to drift on the zephyrs of consciousness gusting around the station, down cramped, darkened corridors, hooded tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus and the shuffling acolytes of the Adeptus Astra Telepathica past. She could sense their unease, for she felt it too, a tangible miasma permeating the very air, circulated by millennia-old atmosphere conditioners. On instinct, she allowed her spirit self to coast on the emotional slipstream of a trooper as he marched purposely towards the control centre of the Orman Tep listening station. The trooper, a member of the elite Kazakin company that had been dispatched from Cadia to garrison the post, swung open the heavy blast door of the control centre and stepped into a scene of barely controlled mayhem. Tech priests and acolytes crowded around cogitators and pick slates, some issuing orders, others hurrying to carry them out. Some debated with fellows while others raised voices in denial. Still more knelt in prayer to the god-emperor of mankind, while others sat with head in hands. Into this scene, Neem followed the trooper, who strode calmly amidst the turmoil to stand at attention before a man who was clearly his superior. The trooper saluted, handed the officer a data slate, and was dismissed. The officer surveyed the room, his rugged, noble features showing barely contained disdain at the lack of discipline surrounding him. He lifted the slate, his piercing eyes speed reading, the information displayed on its glowing pick screen. He turned, issuing an order to an acolyte, though Neem's spirit self could make out no more than a ghostly echo as he spoke. The acolyte hurried to a cogitator bank, his hands speeding over the dials and levers. A massive display at the centre of the chamber came to life. Grainy static splashed across its surface. The image resolved into a view of the barren oxide wastes of Ormantep. Low, jagged hills serrated the horizon. The officer barked an order, and the acolyte adjusted the controls. A crosshair appeared in the centre of the screen, and the scene zoomed in on a patch of sky a numeric counter set in the corner of the target icon counting up the magnification. Even at maximum zoom, the picture was barely discernible, yet Neem could make out a trio of white contrails streaking across the night sky towards the distant mountains. She concentrated, allowing her spirit to lift. Up through the vaulted ceiling of the control chamber, 
through dark access ways and service ducts, through plates of armour-plast sheathing and out into the night. The domed form of the control centre squatted on the barren surface below, secondary structures adjoining it at seemingly random points. She drifted higher, imagining herself buffeted by high-altitude winds that her spirit self had no way of perceiving. Turning her sight on the distant horizon, she sped in the direction she had been shown by the Pict. Several kilometres out into the oxide wastes, Neem caught sight of the streaks of fire slashing across the dark sky. The three lights passed across the livid purple stain that was the distant, though still too close, edge of the ocularis terribus, the eye of terror. The cosmic scale rent in the fabric of reality, through which the most dreaded of humanity's foes had fled ten thousand years before, and through which no sane man should pass. Stealing herself, Neem sped on, until she saw a distant cloud billow up from the base of an ancient crater. In her chamber, Neem Fortuna gasped as her spirit self returned to her body. She bent double, dry retching as a wave of nausea hit. She had seen them. Massively armoured warriors in black and gold, disembarking from dread engines of demon-spawned technology. Intruders had made planetfall on Ormantep. Is there any danger of you actually finishing today, Deacon? Just give me a sec, will you? I'm almost done. Shift ended ten minutes ago. Get a move on, or we're off without you. Guido Sol hefted the power pack of his drill rig as he exited the mine shaft. His bulky pressure suit was encrusted with the dust and grime of another fruitless ten-hour shift at the face. Deacon, his partner in this fool's errand of a contract, emerged a moment later, a gloved hand raised to shield his visored face from the glare of the warp-spawned energies of the ocularis raging in the night sky above. While Deacon struggled with his power packs and feed lines, Sol strode over to the ledge of the cliff into which the mine was sunk. The desolate plain stretched for miles below him, the rust-coloured deposits of eons tinged a sickly violet by the glow of the Eye of Terror. A low wind swept across the barrens, stirring eddies of dust that skimmed off towards the distant horizon. I hate this place. Sol and his crew were indentured workers. Miners shipped him from off-world to work the mines of Ormantep for what had seemed, at the time they had signed up, a tidy profit. But on their arrival, they had found themselves indebted to their Adeptus Mechanicus employers for the cost of the interstellar journey, and that cost had amounted to the equivalent of a lifetime in service to the Adeptus Overseers. Finally, Deacon was ready, and Sol set off towards their crawler where the rest of the miners waited. But the other man had stopped again and was staring up into the sky, his squinting eyes visible through the plastic shield of his pressure hood. For the Emperor's mercy, what now? Deacon pointed, and Sol turned. As he did so, a superheated mass of screaming metal thundered overhead, throwing both men to the ground with the force of its backwash. Sol felt the rubber of his pressure suit melting into his back, and he fought to remain conscious as the mountainside was churned with dust and flying rock. Sol raised his head, his ears ringing from the force of the object's passage. As the tumult of its passing settled, he could make out the form of his companion rising from the ground and dusting himself off. Standing up, he was afforded a view of a blossoming mushroom cloud at the base of an unnamed crater not half a kilometre distant. You reckon we should check it out? Deacon asked, uncertain. Might be a claim on it, Deck. Splits two ways. We might be able to pay off the tex and ship out of here, I guess. Split two ways, Sol, said Deacon, a wry grin, touching his lips as a realisation dawned. Aye, Vox down to the crew. Tell him to head back with us. The Adeptus Astra Telepathica Acolyte led Captain Vrost into the vaulted chamber of the Astropathic Choir. Neem hurried to keep up with the Kazakin officer. He halted abruptly in the centre, causing the Psyker to stumble as she barely avoided colliding into his back. The Acolyte approached a shadowed niche at the head of the dimly lit chamber and bowed before his master, Astropath Primus Grensky. 
who reclined amidst a mass of purity-sealed pipes and cables on a Spartan couch within. Grinsky did not acknowledge the younger adept, as he was deep within the trance that would allow him to transmit his thoughts light years across the gulf of interstellar space to commune with his peers on a thousand other worlds. Captain Vrost surveyed the chamber, obviously impatient with such matters. He preferred to leave this sort of thing to Fortuna, the sanctioned psyker attached to his command. Neem could sense he was ill at ease in the company of those who did not serve the Emperor as he did, with cold logic and cold steel. What's the problem, Adept? Why have you interrupted my sweep? Vrost had been busy overseeing the station's security in the aftermath of the sighting of the intrusion and Fortuna's subsequent report of her viewing trance. My master has been within the auto seance for three hours now, Captain. He should have established contact with another terminus long ago. His life signs indicate he is not, and that he is locked within his trance. Those signs have started to fluctuate wildly. So? asked Vrost, his ignorance of the adept's words plain. He means, interrupted Neem, as the acolyte stumbled over an explanation, that something out there is blocking him, stopping him from getting the message out that the intruders are here. Well, there's no way to be sure of that. The acolyte glanced at her lapel. Lieutenant. Neem scanned the chamber, wrapping her arms around herself against the cold. Another seven niches were arrayed around the room, an astropath reclining within each one. Her breath fogged as she spoke. No, well, something isn't right, and we all know that an intrusion this close to the gate is bad news. I can assure you, Lieutenant, that everything is... An alarm blared from a brass horn above Adeb Grinsky's niche. And every astropath in the choir suddenly sat bolt upright before collapsing back down within their couches. A look of horrified disgust crossed the captain's face, but Neem was looking at the reader mounted next to Grinsky's niche. A series of green lines crossed the display, each zigzagging wildly. The adept was clearly on the verge of panic, and Vrost was barking an order to the Kazakin in the lobby without. Neem's eyes left the reader and settled on the face of the astropath. She shivered and realised abruptly that it was not nerves turning her skin to goose flesh, but the temperature it was falling rapidly. A drop of blood appeared at Grinsky's nostril. Something stabbed into Neem's mind, a spike of indescribable agony at the centre of her brain that withdrew as suddenly as it had appeared, sending her crashing to her knees, clutching her head in her hands. The acolyte was praying, and Neem opened her watering eyes to see that the astropath's face was covered in a thin skein of ice. She turned her head, seeing the occupants of the other niches were similarly affected. She tried to stand, but her knees were stuck fast to the frost, glazing the paved floor. Two Kazakin rushed into the room and grabbed Neem under her armpits, dragging her back towards the chamber door. The acolyte collapsed at his master's feet and let out a piteous wail. The sound Neem imagined a lost soul might voice as it writhed in the flames of purgatory. The last thing she saw as she was pulled from the choir chamber was steady streams of blood from every astropath's nose, freezing, even as they poured, to shatter into a thousand ruby shards as they hit the cold stone floor. Sol raised his head over the rock to get a clear view of the base of the crater. Glimpsing movement below, he ducked back down as Deacon reached the top of the path and collapsed, out of breath beside him. What do you see, Sol? The miner raised his hand to silence him and edged around the base of the rock. Less than 50 metres below, he could make out three towering metal forms, mechanical claws sunk into the hard ground, with strange symbols etched on every surface. Large figures moved around them. Sol had never seen suits the like of which they were wearing. The machines were moving, and Sol's eyes widened in disbelief as he realised their claws were digging down into the earth with an insect-like scurrying motion that he had never seen a machine do before. Now that's some rig, whispered Sol, anger passing over his features at the prospect of another crew working his claim. There ain't no rig, Sol. I don't for the life of me know what it is, but I'm telling you, there ain't no rig I've ever seen. Deacon was leaning out over the rock face, and the pair saw the three machines sink entirely beneath the dusty ground as the figures below dispersed. Okay, okay, we've got to think this through, said Sol. 
The thought that perhaps the intruders were not merely competing prospectors, but something far worse, caused him to reconsider the wisdom of his decision to send the crawler home without them. Right, I've got a plan. A single shot rang out, from scant metres behind them. Sol spun, only to be confronted by a giant in black and gold armour standing over him. Edging back against the rock, he glanced to his side at Deacon. The other miner was spread eagle, the back of his hood a ragged mess and a fan of blood and bone spattered across the boulder. The black armoured warrior swung his aim across and Sol found himself staring down the barrel of the pistol. Damn, cursed Sol. The harsh report of the bolt pistol echoed off the sides of the cliff face and rolled out over the barren wastes as the Black Legionnaire pulled the trigger. Captain Vrost stood at the centre of the control chamber, hands clasped behind his back. Before him, a bank of pig screens lined the wall, each man by a Cadian staff officer. Each viewer relayed the scene from a surveyor, some set atop the armoured towers of the listening station, others mounted on remote pylons several kilometres out into the wastes. Seven of the viewers had gone offline in the last 29 minutes. An ensign turned and beckoned to his captain. Sir, squad three reports sector Epsilon clear. The surveyor shows no sign of interference. Vrost grunted, and the officer returned to his vigil, relaying the order to the squad to move on to sector Gamma. Picking out surveyor Epsilon seven from the bank of screens, Vrost could make out the men of squad three as they prepared to depart. They were deployed in textbook fashion. The perimeter secured and a two-man detail investigating the survey unit. The squad leader was Sergeant Hesker, a man who had served under Vrost for the best part of two years. If they got through whatever was headed their way, thought Vrost, he was due a promotion. Tell Hesker to move his men on, Vrost ordered, turning as Lieutenant Fortuna appeared at his side. Wait, Neem called, and the staffer turned, looking to his superior for confirmation. Irritation crossed Vrost's face, as he turned to look down at the psyker. Lieutenant Fortuna, you will leave my command centre or hold your tongue. Silence descended, and none dared turn to watch. Fortuna raised her flushed face to meet the captain's steely glare. She was much shorter than the veteran officer, and her voice trembled as she replied. Captain, please listen to me. I'm schooled in these matters. Something's wrong out there. I know it. Vrost turned and gestured at the viewers. Of course something's wrong, Fortuna. Surveyor Gamma 12 has just gone offline, sir, the Ensign said, confirming Frost's statement. I can see, Ensign. Put me through to Sergeant Hesker right now. The Ensign's hands moved over a series of dials and switches, and he spoke quietly into his Vox set. On the Vox, sir, he eventually replied. Addressing Sergeant Hesker, Frost spoke clearly. The tone of an experienced leader of men ringing clear in his voice. Erska, listen to me, and follow my orders to the letter. Squad 9 is holding station at Gamma 3. I want you to fall back and regroup with Clorin's squad. It's only half a kilometre due west of your position. Confirm. Static burbled from the Vauxhorn for a moment, before Heska's voice cut through amidst a storm of interference. Confirm, Captain. Moving out now. Tell him to hurry. Something's close. Neem stood beside Vrost her expression betraying uncertainty, warring with the determination to make him appreciate the danger she sensed was near. Vrost bit back a caustic reply, instead ordering a staffer to call up the view from Surveyor Gamma Free. The picture appeared on the large screen in the centre of a wall. The scene was of controlled drill ground efficiency, as Squad 9 took position in what little cover was afforded by the scattered boulders and low defiles out in the wastes. The minutes stretched out, punctured by a staffer confirming Hesker's position and status. Each time a curt, no contact, was the reply. After 33 minutes, the staff officer drew Vrost's attention to the main screen. A dust blizzard was closing in on Squad 9's position, reducing visibility to less than 20 metres. Another five minutes passed, and a silhouette emerged from the storm. The men of Squad 9 raised their hell guns at the figure, and the challenge came loud over the main vox. Identify Arcadia. Arcadia Est, came the swift and correct reply. Sergeant Clorin 
stepped out from cover to shake the hand of his comrade, Sergeant Hesker, while the next man followed in. Neem's indrawn gasp caused every head in the chamber to turn towards her. Tell him! Sergeant Hesker tumbled forward against Clorin as his chest exploded. Clorin must have assumed his friend had stumbled and bent down to lend a hand. The movement saved his life as a fusillade of bolter fire erupted from the storm, pinning the Kazakin of Squad 9 behind cover. Clorin, reading the situation, dragged Hesker's limp form into the cover of a low rock, bellowing orders to his men. Vrost stepped forward, addressing a tech priest, hovering near the cogitator banks. Adept, I need the surveyor set to read the body heat of whatever's assaulting my men. Can you do it? The tech priest nodded and began a recitation of the Canticill Machina over the surveyor bank. Turning to a staff officer, the captain barked his next order. Ensign, I want a Valkyrie out there right now. Those men must be evacuated immediately. But, sir, the staffer began to protest. The storm will make... Don't give me excuses, damn it, just do it. The scene on the main screen switched to a kaleidoscopic riot of colour as the tech priest petitioned the machine spirit to relay an image based on thermographic readings. The colours resolved into solid masses, the cold air of the dust storm visible as swirling, deep blue vortices, and the forms of the Kazakin as distinct red shapes. The surveyor altered its focus, seeking to penetrate the veil of howling dust that obscured the attackers. A score of orange forms emerged from the blue. The heat issued from them so intense the surveyor could not resolve their exact shapes beyond this formless mass. Twin stars of bright white sat at the shoulder of each figure, and further strobes of glaring light indicated muzzle flashes as Bolter spat high-velocity explosive rounds into the Kazakin position. A clutch of fading red smears indicated that the men of Hesker's squad had fallen, cut down from behind before they could reach the dubious safety of Squad 9's position. Vrost addressed the remaining squad leader with an authoritative calm. Chlorin! I have a Valkyrie closing on your position. ETA, he glanced at the tactical reader. ETA, three minutes, thirty. Until then you have some soldiering to do. Sergeant Clorin's voice came across the Vox, barely audible above the chatter of bolter shells, the crack of Helgens, and the howl of the dust storm. Confirm, sir. We'll hold them, pending extraction. You'll do as I say, Sergeant, or there will be no extraction. Now listen to me. Captain Vrost relayed a series of instructions to the squad leader, specifying targets that the Kazakin could not acquire through the dust, but that he could read clearly on the thermographic surveyor. Over the next minute, three of Clorin's men fell to bolter fire, before Vrost ordered the men to fall back to a small ravine they could defend should the position be attacked frontally. Thirty-eight seconds later, one of the attackers fell to the disciplined fire of the remaining defenders, and a brief cheer filled the control chamber before a stern look from Vrost silenced the staff. Another ten seconds, and the attackers had moved round to outflank the Kazakin. Vrost redirected Clorin's squad to fire on the new threat, and another attacker fell. Another twenty seconds, and only three of the squad remained. Massive forms emerged from the dust, and the Kazakin were firing at will. Vrost turned to a staffer. Grim resolution etched across his features. Recall the Valkyrie. Neem turned on him. You can't. They've got to get them out of there. You can't just let them die without... Vros met her gaze and indicated the screen. The last of the Kazakin had fallen and the attackers had taken the position. Dejected, the psycho made to leave the chamber but turned once more to speak. You know they didn't have a hope, didn't you? Of course I knew, Lieutenant. But those men... With Cadians. They were Kazakhin. They deserved nothing less than a warrior's death. And that's what I gave them. Over the course of the next six hours, Captain Vrost supervised the preparation for the attack. He was now certain would come. Though the base was well defended, he made certain every conceivable eventuality was covered, above and beyond that which the layered defence hardware and the elite of the Cadian military were trained for. Every entrance to the listening post was welded shut, booby-trapped with frag grenades and guarded by a squad of Kazakhin. Flakboard barricades were erected across every corridor and heavy weapon positions placed at each intersection. Every last man of the company knew his role in the defence and manned his post with the determination the Cadians, and in particular the elite Kazakhin, 
were famous across the Imperium Four. Plans were laid, fire solutions calculated, and rally points identified. If a position should collapse, the defenders would fall back to the next, under covering fire from the men occupying it. The final stand would be made at the central keep, the chamber of the astropathic choir. If that should fall, then there would be no further point in a fighting withdrawal, for all would be lost. Throughout this period, Neem meditated. She had prayed to the Emperor, so many light years away on distant terror, that she would not fail in her duty to him. She had prayed that astropath Primus Grensky, the sole survivor of the events in the astropathic chamber, would awake from his deathbed and somehow summon the strength to get a warning to Cadia, to anybody, to warn of the attack. She prayed that, should the attack come and Vrost's defences fall, the Emperor would lend her strength to face her death in the manner the teachings of the Cadian progeniums prescribed, on her feet and with her wounds to the fore. In the Apothecarium, Astropath Primus Grensky awoke from feverish dreams of worlds in flames and the diabolic hordes of the arch-enemy vomiting from the hell-mouth of the Cadian Gate. He was too weak to call out. Sensing his death was near, he attempted once more to broadcast an astro-telepathic plea for aid, but another mind sensed his own and unleashed the full extent of its powers against his frail, battered psyche. As life ebbed from his ancient frame, Grinsky consoled himself that he had tried, though whether he had succeeded, he would never know. The first warning of the attack came when the power cut out across the complex. The bank of surveyor screens went black in a second, and the consoles died. The omnipresent background vox chatter fell silent. Standing in the centre of the command chamber, Neem found her world plunged into disorientating darkness. There was a moment of preternatural still, and then a harsh white beam cut through the gloom, dazzling her. An instant later, more beams illuminated the chamber. With a sigh of relief, Neem realised that the Kazakhin guards had activated the torches slung under the barrels of their hell guns. A beam swung across the chamber to pick out Captain Vrost. Get that light out of my face, trooper, he ordered testily. Adept, where are the backups? A hooded adept of the machine god, visible only as a bent form in the shadowed corner of the chamber, began a low chant as he prized open a purity-sealed access panel. He paused in his work long enough to issue a sibilant hiss of annoyance before striking an illuminated rune he had uncovered amidst the innards of the machinery. A bass thrum, felt deep in the gut rather than heard through the ear, filled the room. The drone soared painfully up the scale until it was an ultrasonic squeal beyond the range of human hearing. An instant later, a heavy jolt shook the chamber and a deep red illumination grew in brightness from emergency glow globes, casting a hellish radiance across the occupants as the reassuring hum of the backup generator settled into the background. The surveyor screens spluttered back to life, and the staff officers manning their posts began the rituals necessary to bring their consoles back online. Vrost knew from experience that he would be tactically blind until his command center was fully operational again. But that was one of the reasons the Cadians, along with other Imperial Guard regiments, employed sanctioned psychers. Lieutenant Fortuna, if you'd be so kind. Neem started, realizing the captain had addressed her. Sir? Lieutenant, you may have noticed that we've lost all command and control capability short of squad level Vox. I have no idea what has caused the power shutdown, and I have no way of finding out until the security net is back up. If you wouldn't mind, and if you're not too busy, perhaps you could find the time to use those vaunted powers of yours to find out what the hell is going on. Neem resolved to rise above Vrost's sarcasm. Though he was a commanding officer by dint of rank, she answered to the officio Sycana back on Cadia, and would no longer be cowed by his bearing. She stood firm, lifted her head in defiance, and faced the captain. I'll need absolute silence, she said. Vrost merely nodded and stalked off to the surveyor stations to hurry up their restarting. Neem watched him for a moment, reading the emotions radiating from him in palpable waves. She was a psyker, and well accustomed to the distaste or outright hostility most people felt towards her kind. It was often only in the service of the guard that a sanctioned psyker could earn respite from the distrust of others and find a productive outlet for their powers. Ironically, a life of isolation, of persecution, was often violently curtailed upon the battlefields of the Cadian Gate 
as many a psyker would lay down their lives in defence of those who hated them. Neem closed her eyes, and taking a deep breath, allowed her extrasensory powers to absorb the emotions of those around her. She filtered out the tension in the command chamber and cast her psychic net further afield. One sector at a time, she scanned the perimeter of the complex, seeking out thoughts that did not belong to the defenders. At the edge of her inner hearing, she caught an echoing whisper, like the sound of a malicious plotting in the nave of an empty cathedral. Bracing herself, she homed in, a feeling of utter menace welling up inside her. Suddenly she realised the nature of the threat and severed the psychic link. She broke the contact a moment too late. An explosion of pain erupted behind her eyes, the psychic backlash throwing her several metres across the chamber. She caught a railing and braced herself as a second wave hit, fighting with all her resolve against the white-hot lance of another's psyche. She drew strength from years of conditioning, calling upon deep reserves of her own power. With a tremendous effort of will, she forced the probing claws of agony from her mind, exercising the other's intrusion with a primal scream of denial. Gasping for breath, she shouted at Rost, Sector 12! before slumping to the floor in exhaustion. Thunderous explosions rocked the station, shaking the command chamber and setting off wailing alarms. The squad-level Vox burst into life and a staff officer called to Vrost over the din. Sir, Sector 12 is under fire, reporting unidentified contacts assaulting their position. Command group, with me. That means you too, Fortuna. On your feet. Squads 7 and 12 form up. 1 and 2. Get this chamber secure and stay alert. The Kazakin moved into position without hesitation, and Vrost's command squad was at his side in an instant. A sergeant ushered Neem forward, along with a Vox operator, a medic, and two troopers carrying flamers. The guards stationed at the entrance to the command chamber hauled open the massive blast doors, and Vrost led his men out into the emergency lit passage. Jogging down the corridor, the troopers of Squad 7 took the point, hell guns levelled and covering every angle from which an attacker might appear. The point man reached a bulkhead door that led to the loading base, and the group covered the trooper as he turned the locking wheel. The door ground aside, revealing a scene of desperate combat. A squad of Kazakin poured a fusillade of Helgen fire, the length of the loading bay, from behind a flatboard barricade. At the far end, a score of two and a half metre tall giants were advancing, halting periodically to fire off explosive bolt rounds that tore great chunks from the defender's cover. Vros took position at the barricade, his men following his example. On my mark, fire! As the attackers advanced, 30 Hellguns opened fire as one. Though not individually as powerful as a bolter, massed Hellgun fire is capable of overwhelming most foes, no matter how well armoured they may be. The nearest attacker faltered, great chunks of his breastplate disintegrating as the volleys hammered home. The armour fused and bubbled. A single bright las round exploited the weakness opened up and speared through the figure's torso, to erupt from its back in a shower of sparks. The giant fell. It did not bleed, but its wounds were instantly cauterised. Vrost ordered a second volley, and this time three more of the armoured behemoths fell. The advance slowed, and one of the attackers sought cover in a side corridor rather than risk another fusillade. The defenders took a collective breath, but kept up their surveillance of the bay. Vrost was proud of every one of his men, knowing that a less well-disciplined unit than the Kazakhin would erupt in cheers at this stage, creating a moment of vulnerability an experienced enemy could exploit. Sir, Vrost's Vox operator crawled to his side, a portable scanner held before him. They're moving down Corridor Delta 7, sir. I think they've overridden the lockout. They'll be on us in 30 seconds. Fall back by squads to Rally Point Secundus Delta 7. Go! Vrost yelled as he ushered the first of the Kazakhin past. With drilled proficiency, each squad withdrew from the barricade, covering one another as they stepped down. Brost was the last to quit the loading bay, and the clang, as he slammed the blast door shut, rang down the corridor as he jogged after his men. An explosion tore into the head of the file, ripping apart the point men. The corridor was instantly choked with reeking smoke and the screams of the wounded. A trooper tumbled out of the turmoil, one arm hanging limp and blasted at his side while the other fired his hell gun into the darkness behind. The medic ran to his side to usher him to safety as more Kazakin knelt and poured suppressive fire into the roiling smoke. The Vox operator was at Vrost's side, trying all he could to get a fix on the situation. 
My set's wasted, sir. I can't get a clear reading. Vrost cast his gaze around and located Neem. Can you tell what's going on up there, Lieutenant? Though visibly shaken, the psyker nodded and after a moment of stillness shook her head. I can't, sir. Someone's... A hail of explosive bolts sighed from the smoke, followed a moment later by the silhouette of a massive bulky form. The figure was revealed as its passing caused the smoke to part. A giant of a man in Baroque power armour, the evil of millennia writ large across his helmeted visage. He stooped and with one hand choked the life from a nearby Kazakin, whilst putting a bolt round into the throat of another, a fountain of arterial blood that looked like black tar in the red emergency lighting sprayed across the wall. In Vrost's long career, he had never seen such a foe, but there was no doubt in his mind now as to the identity of the attackers. Traitor marines of the Black Legion, the Praetorians of the War Master Horus himself, the arch-traitor. Seeing his men being slaughtered where they stood, and judging that they were on the verge of being overwhelmed, he bellowed the order to retreat to the command chamber. No, wait, stammered Neem. Not the command centre. There's something. There's someone. The star chamber. We've got to get to the astropathic choir. Rounding on Neem, the captain was silenced by the certainty in her expression. His command was falling apart and he was expected to trust psycho witchery. Cursing the vagaries of fate, he rescinded his order, instructing the squad leaders to head for the star chamber instead. The Kazakin fought a fighting withdrawal down the length of the corridor and passed a bulkhead door that was blown open by a thunderous blast almost as soon as it was sealed behind them. The Black Legion pursued relentlessly. The Kazakin, unable to bring their own weapons to bear in any meaningful way in the confines of the passageway. Men fell screaming and Vros took a bloody wound to the shoulder from a ricocheting bolt as they made for the final junction before the star chamber. Rounding a corner, they found themselves running towards a hastily erected barricade across the chamber entrance and threw themselves over it as reaching arms dragged stragglers to safety. Vrost took in his command. Less than a score of men had survived and his Vox operator and medic were missing. Taking position with the barricade's defenders, the remaining Kazakin prepared to sell their lives dearly at this, the last rally point. The Black Legion gave chase, emerging into the junction before the Star Chamber and a dozen towering men spreading out as they raised their bolters. At their head was a figure from a nightmare, his armour reeved in arcane sigils, black robes billowing behind him, cold blue electrical discharges reeved his hand as he gestured towards the defenders. None behind the barricade knew the tongue in which the sorcerer spoke, but all felt the meaning behind his dark words deep within themselves. Here was a follower of the ruinous powers, and he intended to offer every soul in the complex to his corrupt masters. Neem forced the sorcerer's incantations from her mind, attempting to gather her strength for one last stand against the impossible odds facing them. But her thoughts were interrupted by a new presence, a shift in the ebb and flow of the powers raging around her. She tilted her head, as if straining to discern a single whisper above a thunderous chorus. What was it she could hear? The Black Legionnaires opened fire. A storm of bolts, punching through the flatboard barricades and cutting men down in bloody swathes. The Kazakin returned fire, though for every last bolt they unleashed, ten bolt rounds were returned. The Black Legionnaires were almost on the barricade, when a piercing sound cut through the din of battle and the haze of gun smoke. A mournful howl, low and feral, echoed down the corridors. The roaring of the Black Legionnaires' bolters fell silent and the sorcerer's blasphemous utterances caught in his throat. Another howl split the air mere metres behind the traitor marines. They paused, casting uncertain glances into the shadows. Neem raised her head above the barricade in time to see a black legionnaire snatched from behind and dragged into the dark. A bestial snarl grew to a savage outburst of rage, and the sound of splintering ceramite armour rang from the walls. The traitor marines began firing into the shadows around them, emptying entire magazines at targets none of the defenders could see. Taking advantage of the distraction, Vros led his men back into the star chamber, and the massive embossed doors slammed together as the last man stumbled through. The sounds of battle increased to fever pitch on the other side of the portal, screams of rage and pain muffled by the barrier. Then, silence for a moment. Broken an instant later, 
by the doors exploding inwards. The Black Legion sorcerer stood framed in the doorway, arcs of blue lightning creeping from his hands and along the bulkhead. He scanned the chamber, his visored gaze sweeping the survivors until it came to rest upon the form of Neem Fortuna. She sensed his recognition, for he knew she was a psyker, the last person with any hope of calling for outside aid. As he strode towards her, Captain Vrost drew his chainsword and threw himself at the traitor, only to be battered aside with contemptuous ease with a single backhanded stroke. Vrost threw across the chamber, slamming into the stone wall with a sickening crunch of splintering bone. The sorcerer advanced on the defenceless psyker, more black legionnaires flanking him. The last of the Kazakin made to intercept them, but were cut down by bolt rounds or hacked apart by screeching chainswords. The reek of gun smoke and freshly spilled blood assaulted Neem's senses as she pulled herself upright, determined at last to face her death on her feet. As she straightened, back to the cold wall, a black legionnaire screamed in pain and rage, his back arcing and his arms spread wide. His bolter clattered to the floor as a white hot light speared from his eyes and mouth. The point of a sword, a fire, with pristine energy burst through his chest plate, transfixing him for an instant before it was withdrawn, sending the traitor's blasted body crashing to the ground. Another man stepped through the entrance, fully a match for the Black Legionnaires in bulk and height. But in stature, the similarity ended. For this mighty warrior wore dark grey armour adorned with a panoply of pelts, totems and fetishes. Mounted over his bold head was a hood of intricate crystalline nodes that formed a halo of psychic balefire around him. Neem was overwhelmed by the power emanating from him and knew that here was a master of the psyker's craft, infinitely more accomplished than she could possibly aspire to become. The Black Legion sorcerer turned, a low hiss sounding from the mouthpiece of his helmet, Issuing a guttural incantation, he pointed at the chamber entrance, and a violet-hued barrier of warp-spawned power sealed it so that none could interfere. He took a step back, clearly making room for the clash he knew would ensue. As dulled sounds of battle emanated from beyond the barrier, the warrior stepped forward, the glow from his crackling hood becoming more intense. He raised his sword, the sorcerer raised his staff, and the two lunged at precisely the same instant. The warrior mystic was faster, deflecting the traitor's weapon with a backhanded parry. Stepping inside his opponent's guard, he brought his knee up hard, slamming it into the sorcerer's stomach. The legionnaire doubled over, but cartwheeled his staff up behind him as he did so, driving it into the warrior's chest armour. The newcomer staggered as arcane fire flickered across his body, a mighty crack in the ceramite of his breastplate, evidence of the sorcerer's strength. Indistinct shadows appeared at the entrance, mighty claws raking at the mystic barrier. Putting space between them, both combatants stepped back. Neem could sense the build-up of arcane energies. Pure white light danced across the warrior's blade, while a black nimbus appeared before the traitor. Both men stood immobile as the energies built, accompanied by a roar of psychic feedback that caused Neem to drop to her knees, her hands clamped over her ears. As one, both combatants unleashed their pent-up energies, which jumped the centre of the chamber in a heartbeat and thundered into the other caster. Both were thrown sprawling to the floor, and through the play of sorcerer's powers, Neem saw that the warrior mystic was grievously wounded, a terrible gash running along one side of his head and blood seeping from the crack in his chest. The warp barrier was assailed by frenzied shapes throwing themselves against it, accompanied by a savage roar of anger and pain. The traitor gained his feet and stood unsteadily at first, but then with an arrogant swagger as he crossed to the fallen warrior. The energies playing around his hood spat and sputtered, the pure light of his force sword fading to be replaced with the gleam of ordinary steel. The sorcerer raised his staff high above his head with both hands, Neem saw with absolute clarity that she could not allow this to happen. In the infinite chasm between one moment in time and the next, she drew every last shred of energy she possessed, drawing so deep on reserves of psychic power that she could feel the creatures of the warp scratching at her soul as she channeled the very stuff of their realm through her flesh. 
She screamed as her body became a vessel for a tidal wave of arcing energies, unleashing it in a mighty, uncontrollable burst at the Black Legion sorcerer. The force of her attack sent him reeling, an upraised hand attempting to repel the lightning that enveloped him. Caught up in the blizzard, the sorcerer never saw the sweeping blow of the warrior mystic sword that clove him in two from the chest of his helm to his groin in one mighty downward slash. Neem fought to hang on to the last shreds of consciousness. Through eyes that refused to focus, she saw the warp barrier blink out of existence, and a creature from nightmare leapt through the star chamber entrance. It lunged at her, pinning her to the ground, animal jaws snapping in her face as its claws raked the flesh of her forearms. A single word in an unfamiliar tongue cut through the snarling, and the beast was gone. Neem opened her eyes to see the back of the warrior as he stalked from the chamber, a loping creature with wolf-like features, wearing the mangled remains of tarnished dark grey armour at his side. Wait, she said. He paused, silhouetted, and the fires raging in the passage beyond. Who are... Ah. The warrior held up her hand and uttered words Neem could not understand, before reforming the sentence in a tongue he had clearly not used in many years. Who I am is immaterial, girl. That I was here is all that matters. We leave now to continue the hunt, for the great betrayer is abroad once more. A mast... Doleful howling echoed down the corpse-strewn passages of the Ormantep listening station. Wait! She called again. But the stranger was gone. Ow! Thanks for watching. Bit of, bit of uh, old-school uh, Black Crusade lore. 13th Black Crusade story time. Um, for those of you who don't know... They had a big campaign, like, before they did the... St right, so, the 13th Black Crusade was a thing. It was, like, a big, sort of, worldwide campaign thing, like Armageddon. I'm sure most people have heard about that one. Um, and they did that same thing with the 13th Black Crusade. And then they did nothing with it until uh, a couple of years ago now, probably about four or five years ago now, maybe even six years ago, actually. It's a while. Um, they did the, the Fall of Cadia <clears throat> arc with Gilliman ends up returning and, you know, Call and Cadia Falls and all that stuff. But initially, it was slightly different. They'd rewritten things. And, like, for instance, you know, the Lions come back now. I don't fully understand everything that's gone on with that because I haven't read the book yet. <laughs> and I still haven't. I've had, it, I've had it for months. It's here. It's on my bookshelf. I just haven't bothered reading it. I've got to get through it all. I'll do a video on that as soon as I have, though, my initial thoughts. But, um, getting distracted. What I was going to say was, uh, initially, the Wolven were a big thing um, as part of the 13th Black Crusade. They've been sort of written out of... The later, the, the rewrite, the so the law as it stands now, that none of this really happened, or at least if it happened, uh, it's not been mentioned yet. And obviously, it was supposed to portend uh, the return of the of Russ. You know, Russ goes into the warp, hunting after the traitors, and um, takes the the Wolven Company with them. Um, and obviously, this has all slightly changed since then as well, because there's all. You know, obviously the heresy hadn't been written yet at the time, uh, the Horus Heresy series. So this whole thing about there's no wolves on Fenris, it was a bit more clear cut back in the old days. The Wolven Company were a company consisting of those space wolves who drank from the Canis, uh, the Canis Helix. I forget. It's been a long time since I read those Ragnar Blackmane books, right? But basically they drank from it and due to some uh, deficiency within the, uh, the, pop the, the, the sort of, the population of Fenris, um, some of them became a bit wolvy. They, be they became werewolves. They could become wolves, or they were permanently wolf formed. And it was the and it was implied that some of them became full on wolves. And later on, obviously in the Heresy, this is it's sort of implied that, uh, like a lot of human populations, they genetically altered themselves when they went to new wor worlds to colonize them in order to, you know, be able to live on these harsh environments. And um, the human population of Fenris altered themselves with canine DNA for whatever reason. Or it was some kind of experiment or whatever, you know, whatever. That's the implication. And then when it's affected by the gene seed, this an unforeseen element, like a lot of the sort of space marine genetic issues, you know, blue angels and all the other things, you know, they're, they're sort of mutations are based on the, uh, the gene seed interacting in a way that it shouldn't. And because 
the Space Wolves exclusively, I think pretty much exclusively, uh, recruit from Fenris. I don't know if that's changed now, but initially, anyway, they exclusively recruited from the population of Fenris. Then they uh, that population caused this mutation to occur in the uh, an, un an unforeseen thing from the Emperor's point of view. You get me? So... That's why you get these wolven-like creatures, and they had models for them, and they were just werewolves. You know, it was it was just it was just werewolves in power armor, and um, yeah, they were coming back to fight in the Thirteenth Black Crusade. They've been lost in the warp or hunting for the warp, and obviously time has no meaning there. So they've been fighting their war, and they've just come back to reality, and they don't realize ten thousand years have gone past. And there was all these little short stories and stuff like this, hinting at things, and like everybody was like, "Well, if the wolven are coming back, Russ is coming back." So this is an old school thing from that. Now. Are we going to see that in the future? Potentially. You've, you've already got that sort of base, and that's what GW seems to do. Even if they retcon things, they might, they'll, they'll stick with the core idea, but they'll change the details of it. I think I've, I think that's what's going to happen with this recent show with the Pariah Nexus and the Necrons. They they ditched the Pariah thing as it was years ago, and they also changed, it appears, they've changed some elements of the law uh, for the Necrons, and uh, but they're still going to, that idea of the, of the Pariah gene and all that is going to be incorporated into this new thing. Um, but there's all sorts of stuff happening in 40k. It's all it's all fun and games now. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But this was one of those things that really hinted at the Wolven thing. Anyway, thank you all for watching. I've made promises in the past about stuff that's coming up, and it and and uh, I was wrong. So <laughs> so I'm not going to make any promises about what's coming up next. But I am working on stuff. For instance, next week after this is released, I've uh, got a few days aside uh, that I've made aside, uh, booked aside, where I've got um, you know. No, no, no distractions. And uh, I'm going to be fully working on a bunch of stuff. I don't know when it will come out, but yeah, um, a bunch of stuff is going to get made. Uh, the audio side of things, uh, I need to get that out of the way. And then I can, you know, I can, I can chip away at the actual turning them into videos and editing and everything afterwards. Uh, but I need to just get the audio produced soon, which is sometimes a little bit difficult when you've got a tiny little baby boy um, who comes and finds me. Every time he can now, <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he, he's teething as well. So you've got to you got to take your time when you got to choose your moments when you can. But I've set some time aside. I'm going to be, um, yeah, basically I'm going to have some time aside to just like fully develop myself to recording a couple of things that I've meant to get done for a while. So stuff is coming. I appreciate your patience. For those of you who've been enjoying the uh, the Warhammer Radio stream, thank you all for watching. I'm glad you enjoy it. Uh, I'm going to carry on doing it. I, I sort of was going to do it for a month and see what happened with it. I was worried it affect the channel, um, but it doesn't seem to have had any negative, um, any negative on the channel. I think it's well. I won't go into YouTube speed, but it's something about the algorithm, live streams, and actual videos don't they don't count on as each other. I don't know. But anyway, for those of you enjoying that, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm glad you enjoy it. It's a nice thing to just have, you know. Yeah, I think it's nice because it takes the choice away from people. And that's, you know, it wants choice, right? you got choice with Netflix and you spend an hour going through it and you never watch anything or Amazon Prime or whatever. Uh, this way, you've got no choice. You're going to listen to what I want you to listen to. <laughs> so thank you for everybody enjoying that and everybody supporting the stream, uh, the channel, um, you know, as channel members and uh, as Patreons and on uh, subscribes. Everybody, thank you all, all for your continued support. I really appreciate it. I know I haven't put as much content out as I wanted to, but I've said this before. I'm, I'm not going to apologize anymore. If stuff is coming, this winter is going to be great. There's going to be loads of content. Don't you worry. I will be there in your ear, keeping you company in this as the winter comes. Don't worry. I'll be there. But for now, I've got to go. So I'll see you later. Bye-bye.